Hello everybody, this is Yiji and welcome back to Project Espa. Today I want to continue where we left off in the last video and spend some time with the stars in my star system. Yup, that's right, stars with a plural S. When I first made Espa, it was around a singular star much like our own sun. Though already pretty early on in the project history, I decided this was too simple for me. In the real world, only about 65% of systems contain just one star, with about 10% being binaries and 25% having more than two stars in their system. This is pretty surprising when you first think about it, but multiple star systems are far from uncommon. Now I am someone who likes astronomy world building, so you must best believe I'm not going to keep things simple and have just one star in the axle system. Since at least 2014, the axle system has been composed of three stars, which for working purposes were designated axle alpha, axle beta, and axle gamma. But why three stars specifically instead of two or four? And that's an excellent question which mostly comes down to the considerations I need to make when building a system with multiple stars. Things are nice and simple when you are dealing with just one sun for your planet. Which is why this is by far the safest option to go with, to save yourself from a lot of math and astrophysics. Though, personally, I don't mind those, so let's briefly go over how binary systems work. What you will often see in real life is that multiple star systems separate into different subpairs where you'll never have three stars orbiting a common barycenter, but rather always two and then share a secondary binary center with the rest. You can stack the amount of stars pretty high, but this principle will always tend to endure, simply because this is the way orbits are most stable. I don't want to make things too complicated as the math for finding geologically stable orbits increases exponentially with each star added. But on the other hand, things need not be complicated, as this effect can sort of be reduced by making the distances between the stars either really small or really vast. For this reason, there are really just two models that work for what I want to build here. A Tatooine type binary, where all the planet's orbits are circumbinary, meaning they orbit both stars at once, or a Y type binary, where the stars are far enough away to not intervene too much with each other's orbits. When I'm dealing with three stars, I'm feeling I can do both by having Espa's sun be A and B and C orbit each other as a close pair, which then orbits A at great distance. Why is this important? Stars are not exactly light objects, by which I mean they tend to be very massive objects in their systems with sizable gravities, which can disrupt the formation of planets and the stability of their orbits. To minimize this effect as much as possible, I need to be really careful about the orbital separation between these stars. Now to figure out the actual mechanics and distances and masses and yada 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 would be an enormous task, probably beyond the scope of this video. But as I said before, things need not be complicated. The easy thing we can do is just look for an existing star system that reflects our model and modify that. So let's look at some candidates. When I say candidates, I really just mean this one, because I already decided 10 years ago. The Epsilon Indy system consists of an orange dwarf orbited at great distance by a pair of two brown dwarfs. The orbital separation between the main star and the pair is about 16,600 AU, or astronomical units. An astronomical unit being the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So, at such a great distance, the influences of the pair on the planetary system are going to be minimal. Now, while this fits our model, it doesn't quite fit our stars. Brown dwarfs are very unique and fascinating objects, so I had been on the fence for a long time about whether Axel Beta and Axel Gamma would be brown dwarfs or not. But in the end, I decided not to because I wanted these objects to be visible from ESPA, for which brown dwarfs would just not be luminous enough. So instead, let's make them low mass red dwarfs. As for Axel Alpha itself, I'm going to increase its mass as well, so it sits somewhere in between the Sun and Epsilon Indy. For all intents and purposes, this can be viewed as a single star system due to the great separation. So let's model Alpha after the single star of 82G Eridani. 
As for the Beta Gamma pair, I want them to be fairly low class red dwarfs, possibly M3, M5 or even M8s. There's no real reason why other than that I don't want them to interfere with Alpha's planetary system, so they must be low mass. I also would like to have a small circumbinary planet around them, maybe even two, so they need a tight orbital separation. Those things considered, let's look for some real life red dwarf spectroscopic binaries. And for the Beta Gamma pair, I think EZ Aquarii AC fits exactly what I'm looking for. This star is actually a trinary system, but A and C form an isolated pair of two nearly identical red dwarfs in tight orbit, which are close enough to have a circumbinary system. So for Axel we take Epsilon Indy, replace A with 82G Eridani, and the brown dwarfs with EZ Aquarii AC. Is it that simple? Of course not. But this is an incredibly useful base that saves us a lot of time and math. That said, we will need to tweak some things now to get the Axel system I want. By far the most important property of Alpha will be its mass, since down the road we will derive basically everything in the system off of it. While there is 0.05 uncertainty, in general we currently agree 82 Eridani to have a mass of about 85% that of the Sun. I want Alpha to be unique though, so let's add some digits to make this 0.84868 solar masses. Adding those extra digits to make it feel more realistic. For EZ Aquarii we are a lot less precise, but in general assume both components to be near about a tenth of the sun's mass. So let's make them slightly more separate by having beta be 0.113 and gamma be 0.097 solar masses. As for age, I'm going for some older stars than the sun for now, thinking about 5.7 billion years, making them about a billion years older than the sun, again based on my templates. These are really the only properties I can just pull out of the ether though. The rest we will need to derive from these two. So let's derive these other properties. And I will run through these quickly putting the math on screen. First I approximate the diameter using this. Then, using the temperatures from my template, I can calculate their luminosities using Stefan Boltzmann's law. And finally I can approximate their times on the main sequence using this formula. And there we have it, the physical parameters of our stars. The key formula here being the law of Stefan Boltzmann, which correlates the star's luminosity, radius and temperature. We can approximate the latter two of these using our template stars, but the third one needs to be in correlation with them through this law, for which I calculated the luminosity, as this is by far the most important one for later to be precise about. As you can see, even though the changes in temperature and radius are tiny compared to our sun, this has massively reduced Alpha's luminosity, nearly halving it. Now with all that done, there's one more thing I want to calculate before I want to call this video done, and that's our orbits. Currently our system model is that of Epsilon Indy, but here too I want to make some changes. Firstly I'm happy to have Beta and Gamma be in the same orbital configuration as EZ Aquaria EC, so that part we can leave mostly unchanged. But the Beta Gamma pair together with Alpha, I don't want to leave like Epsilon Indy. The reason why is mostly cosmetics, but hey, it's my world, cosmetics is the single most important thing to me. Now the consideration is that M stars like Beta and Gamma are extremely dim. At just a tenth of a light year distance, they would be dimmer than most other stars in the sky. At which point I might as well say why even have them there in the first place if you can barely distinguish them. So while they need to be far away enough for orbital stability reasons, they also can't be too far away for cosmetic reasons. This actually narrows the range they can be in considerably. Older versions of the Axel system address this by having large eccentricities allowing the pair to get close and bright. But this would only make it so for geologically short times. Much rather I would always have them be visible. This would also relax the pressure on the orbital period. So our hard limits for inner and outer ranges become quite important. Our inner range being defined by the sphere of influence of the Beta Gamma pair, given by this formula, which returns 325 astronomical units which we can subtract from the separation with alpha to get the stability region of alpha. Clear? Well, the answer is... Firstly, we set the periapsis and apoapsis for the components, these being the closest and furthest points in their orbits relating to the center. Using these, we can then calculate the eccentricity and semi-major axis from those using these formulas, and then finally use those to calculate the orbital periods. 
And now we have our own proper star system. While the model of Epsilon Indy remains intact, every other value has been changed, because we changed the masses involved. It also puts the red dwarfs at a distance where they will be by a long shot the brightest stars in the Espen sky, reaching a combined apparent magnitude of negative 7. If we pair this with them being visible in the dark half of the Espen sky, we have exactly what I want. Alright then, that makes a star system. Of course, this is just the skeleton of our entire system, which is gonna be what's really important. But hey, everyone needs a skeleton, so for now I'm really satisfied with this, as it's an excellent basis for us to expand upon in the next videos. So that brings us to the next part. And that is to be the final and most difficult task, which is naming these stars. As for Alpha, that's going to be Ojor, which I had previously decided already. But for Beta and Gamma, I had always previously referred to them as Romulus and Remus, something I don't really like anymore, as I don't want links to the real world through mythology like this. So let's call Beta Bunim and Gamma Asmon, with them together being called the Deshera system. And that brings us to the comments. So for this episode, the comment comes from Amareth Legacy. So amazing to see your process explained so concise. Wholly recommend prospective world builders to take a listen and really take to heart this process. Beginning big gives you a great framework to return to, and due to the bigger scales being more comprehensive, you don't immediately begin to bog yourself down in content overload. Scope creep is real. Do you plan on expanding the wider galaxy outside the system in the future, or is it merely the settings backdrop? Great work all around. Firstly, thanks for the high praise. It really means the world to me to hear people are enjoying this series and are willing to follow along on this world building journey. Secondly, excellent question. So last video I had picked an open star cluster as the stellar neighborhood of Hespa, which you might have noticed was conspicuously absent in this one. And that's because I have already gone ahead and changed it due to the extremely poor conditions for habitability in such a cluster. Hence, I have fallen back to my original idea and moved it to the outskirts of a small, irregular dwarf galaxy. To get to your question though, I do see the galaxy as more of a backdrop due to Axel's unique location on the outskirts of it, so it will only be expanded as needed. The only thing that's really gonna matter about it is how it would appear in the night sky of Espa. I will 100% do a detailed video about the night sky of Espa after I finish the system, but that's likely still a bit off, so I hope that answers your question. If any of you have any more questions, leave them in the comments below and you might make it into the next video. Alright everybody, that will do it for this video. For the next one I think we're going to take a broad look about the planetary system of Ojor, so if you're interested in that, stick around and subscribe. This has been Yiji Online, thank you for watching and I will catch you in the next one. See ya!